example of the failure of this claim is that the PTERV1 is found in the rhesus monkey, olive baboon, and African great apes, but not in humans. This makes it clear that if that the ERVs are evidence of common design, not evolution, since had man and the great apes shared a common ancestor, the great apes would also share the PTERV1 with humans. Nice, Nephi. You've shown your total lack of understanding of how evolution works. Uh, as, on top of that, showing your total inability to do any research whatsoever. Uh, for anyone else watching this, we're talking about endogenous retroviruses. Uh, one of the best evidences I've seen ever to account for common ancestry with apes. Uh, certain viruses inject their genetic code into our genome and it gets passed on through our offspring. This is just the perfect way to track phylogeny. Uh, but Nephi here seems to think otherwise. Anyway, back to you Nephi. Uh, apparently your vast research into biology has failed you. Uh, you didn't come across a protein called TRIM5-alpha. Uh, research has shown that TRIM5-alpha actively prevents the infection of PTERV1, the exact one that you're talking about. Now, unfortunately for you, the organism that has this particular TRIM5-alpha protein happens to be humans. Yeah, that's right, Nevi. Uh, humans, we don't have that particular retroviral insertion because we're immune to it. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, <laughs> the most rudimentary search on the subject would have gotten you that information and you didn't come across it. I wonder why. Could it have been that you got your information from somewhere like creation.com? Anyway, I should stop there, but there's another possibility that you fail to understand, and since it goes straight to the heart of your understanding of evolution, I'm going to beat you over the head with it anyway. Um, when species evolve, they don't evolve the way many people think they do. We see phylogenetic trees, and they show individuals branching off from other individuals in nice, perfectly straight lines, and people tend to think th of this kind of like your family tree, you know, parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, and so on. In reality, though, evolution happens to populations, not individuals. This means there's more of a general cloud of speciation instead of a straight line. This is because a small mutation doesn't turn an individual into a new species, and it can therefore still crossbreed with organisms that are similar enough genetically. It also means that you could drop a trait into a population and it wouldn't necessarily make it to the entire population. These dots here represent hominine, hominini, gorilla, chimpanzee, and human. These are not all the transitions between the subfamily of hominine and the current species that exist, but these are the actual predecessors that will stand in as a metaphor for everything. Now I'm sure that you think of phylogenetic trees in lines like this, which would mean that PTERV1 would have to have been inserted here in order for it to get to chimpanzees and gorillas. But that would mean that the dispersion would have to be total like this, which would mean humans are infected as well. But that's not the case. The fact is, if evolution worked this way, we'd be highly unlikely to ever see new species, since it would mean that a single individual would be responsible for multiple speciation events. This is not how things go, though. Instead, we have to realize that there is an area of crossbreeding. This is where the organisms can interbreed still and aren't necessarily their own separate species. It's not like one day hominine gives birth to a gorilla and a hominine. The gradual mutations separate into different species over long periods of time through populations and not abruptly like people that fear evolution like to think. This means that instead of straight lines between ancestor species and their offspring, they're more like clouds. We have a separate cloud for each species and sometimes they overlap and other times they don't. If you notice in my illustration, there are areas where chimpanzee and gorilla clouds overlap. 
in the spot where they can interbreed but humans don't overlap with gorillas now let's inject a virus into the genome right here it's possible that the virus can infect individuals that can interbreed with species that predate both humans and chimpanzees and even our prior ancestor but all we need is a clean path from an uninfected predecessor that avoids the retrovirus and leads to humans in this illustration we have a clear path right here I know this is not a pretty illustration but I created it this way because this is how species propagate and not in straight lines because of that it's entirely possible that humans can sidestep this infection even if we weren't immune to it so now that we've shown that you can't do research and you have no clue how evolution happens what other things can we catch you with in this video 14 of the so far discovered 98,000 human ERVs are found in the same location in the human genome uh, in chimpanzee genome however this means that 99.99986 percent are not found in the same location okay Nephi I wish you'd make up your mind here uh, you're trying to say that ERVs are evidence of common of a common creator uh, which would suggest that they should be very common between species and they wouldn't be viruses at all uh, you then play up this completely false statement about there only being 14 ERVs which we have in common with chimpanzees which would suggest that it only happens by chance very very occasionally which I'll show a little later that that's not really the case but which is it I mean <laughs> is it by chance or is it intentional you seem to want to play both sides of the fence here now your numbers are completely wrong and you're off by a factor of about 7,000 on the ERVs we share with chimpanzees and about two on the number of HERVK insertions that we share with them um, but let's just act as if you're right for a second uh, what does that mean well let's say that two organisms share a single ERV insertion at the same point in the genome uh, the chances of this happening with two separate infections are approximately one in three billion if the two organisms shared two insertions the chances of the infection happening in two separate organisms is one in nine times ten to the eighteenth uh, now the chances of two organisms sharing fourteen separate infections is approximately one point four times ten to the 141st power. Uh, that's 141 zeros there. Anyway, to put that in perspective for you, if you were to take that many hydrogen atoms, fill the entire universe with them, just pack it just as tight as you can, the entire visible universe, it would be so tightly packed it would become metallic hydrogen. That's how tightly packed we're talking about. And you'd be able to fill approximately five septillion universes with this hydrogen it's metallic hydrogen no now imagine for a second that all you had to do was pick the same exact hydrogen atom that I pick out of all of those hydrogen atoms and all of those universe filled spheres what are the chances of that happening that's about the same chances that you have of two organisms, chimpanzees and human beings, sharing 14 distinct ERV insertion points. So that kind of blows you out of the water for the chance bit of things. Even at 14, what you're saying is like 99.9, .9, anyway, the rest of it's all junk. Even at 14, you're still screwed on it being chance. Now I could go on for an hour debunking all of the stuff in this video. Uh, there's just so much information out there that anybody could get their hands on with just the slightest bit of research. And so to keep beating this dead horse is kind of stupid. But suffice it to say, Nephi, I can hear the cavernous ass that can hold those headphones. And it's coming from you, buddy.